Good morning. My name is Austin. Will you please stand for the reading of God's word? Book of Luke, chapter 20, verses 1 through 19. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people and preaching the good news in the temple, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? Let, let me ask you a question first, he replied. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven, or was it merely human? They, talk, they talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he'll ask why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, the people will stone us. But if we say it was merely human, the people will stone us because they are convinced John was a prophet. So they finally replied that they didn't know. And Jesus responded, Then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Now Jesus turned to the people again and told them this story. A man planted a, a, man planted a vineyard, leased it to tenant farmers, and moved it to another country to live for several years. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of his students to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers attacked the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. So the owner sent another servant, but they also insulted him, beat him up, and sent him away empty-handed. A third man was sent, and they wounded him and chased him away. What will I do, the owner asked. I know, I'll send my cherished son. Surely they will, surely they will respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw his son, they said, they said to each other, Here comes the heir to the estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they dragged him out of the vine vineyard and murdered him. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard would do to them? Jesus asked, I'll tell you, he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. How terrible that such a thing should ever happen, his listeners protested. Jesus looked at them and said, then what does the scripture mean? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Everyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush, any, and it will crush anyone it falls on. The teachers of religious law and the leading priests wanted to arrest Jesus immediately because they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. This ends the reading of God's word. You may now be seated. Thank you, Austin. Great job. And uh, boy, great job by our uh, praise band too, our student band. Wasn't that awesome? Let's show them our appreciation. Always fun, you guys, when we uh, hit that third Sunday of the month and you guys come and lead us in music. It's fantastic. And I know that you put a lot of energy into the preparation as well, so thank you. Before we get started, uh, just a couple of things. I uh, want to pass along our condolences to Dilly Rye and his family. Uh, Dilly is uh, one of our leaders in the um, Nepalese community here at KCC. His mother died on Friday night, and uh, we will have a service here tomorrow for her. Uh, and also, we wanted to pass along our condolences to Kathy Beckley and her mother in the death of Kathy's father, Keith Bodine. There's a service for him tomorrow at First Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And uh, before I get started, I want to tell you what I did yesterday. Yesterday, Christ-Centered Fellowship held their launching service in our gym. I brought a few pictures here. Uh, several families from KCC were here for it. It was an awesome celebration. It only lasted four hours, you know, so that was short. Um, but uh, it was a great time. Our conference superintendent, Greg Yee, was here to pray for the new church, and they had asked me to speak. Uh, so it was a wonderful celebration. Sometime I want to bring uh, Pastor Brooks Collins in so you'll have a chance to meet him. The only difficulty is he's over leading his service right now. They meet in the ministry house basement and right about now he's probably preaching. So uh, we'll have to figure that out carefully. But uh, it's, it's really wonderful to have this new covenant church, mostly Liberian folks starting right here at KCC. Well, our journey through the book of Luke continues. Today we're taking up chapter 20. Now, it feels like we have moved into, you know, kind of the last 15 minutes of a great movie with lots of intrigue. All of the plot lines that have been introduced earlier in Luke are starting 
to come together for us. Last week, we backtracked to Luke 19 when Jesus began his determined journey to get to Jerusalem. You know, there's a statement there. He resolutely set his face for Jerusalem. You see, Jesus understood that his story had to end in Jerusalem. But not only end there, have a radical new beginning in Jerusalem. So he was very focused on getting there. And in chapter 19, the chapter just ahead of the one we want to look at today, we read that Jesus arrived to a great huge welcome and lots of fanfare. Now we're going to save that chapter for Palm Sunday. But once he arrived, Jesus did not mess around. He got right down to business. And I'm going to summarize with just two statements what he did when he got to Jerusalem. First of all, he continued to preach and teach his good news. He was inviting people to enter God's kingdom, which means to live under God's rule. And he was calling on people to repent of their sins and to be forgiven. And here's the second part of it. He came to confront the corrupt religious system that relied on false dogmas and oppressive power structures to actually hinder people from finding their way home to God. In chapter 20, the confrontations begin. Jesus doesn't have to go out of his way to look for trouble. It finds him. Several factions of religious leaders are eager for the chance to confront and try and silence Jesus. And folks, by this point in time, they wanted him and his good news gone, removed, done away with. And what I'm really talking about is they wanted him dead. It wouldn't be enough to just send him packing back to Galilee. But to actually accomplish his death, they'd have to find a charge that would hold some meaning to the Romans because the Romans controlled capital punishment. Shortly after arriving in Jerusalem, Jesus made his way to the temple, the center of Israel's faith and worship. But this time, Jesus had not come to make a sacrifice or to offer prayers. He had done that in the past. He came to forcefully confront the corruption that was compromising the temple's very purpose. Sacrificial animals and birds were being sold to eager worshipers at outrageous profits. Profit margins for sellers were through the roof, and the temple was getting its cut. Let me read verse 45 of chapter 19 just to set all of this up. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. That shocking event sets up this week of vocal wars between Jesus and the religious leaders. But certainly it wasn't the only thing that they held against him. Here's the situation as we head into chapter 20. The common people love Jesus. Many of them believe he's the Messiah that is going to make everything right that's wrong with Israel. He's going to expel the Romans. He's going to introduce economic recovery. With him will come a time of spiritual revival. Against Jesus were the angry priests Jesus had walked into their house and made a mess of things, challenging their system that they thought was working. And the teachers of the religious law, sometimes in the past we've referred to them as scribes, they're scholars. They're always closely associated with the Pharisees. Pharisees were this group of people that were trying to keep with perfection all of Israel's law codes, but you know, not just what we read about in the scripture, but all the interpretations and oral traditions down through the centuries. I mean, it was complex. The Pharisees couldn't possibly pull it off without having a group of scholars who were with them all the time to advise them. They had this three year running battle with Jesus over his rejection, not just of the law or of certain laws, 
but their whole approach to the law, the way they use it to try and demand something from God. And then we read also that there were other unspecified religious leaders who are not mentioned. And they're all a part of this vaunted power structure of Israel. And folks, you thought American politics was complicated in an election year. Try first century Israel, Jerusalem, in the time of Jesus. We're told these religious leaders didn't have the foggiest idea how to go about getting Jesus arrested on a charge that would mean anything to the Romans. But they did know the idea of authority and where do you get your authority was underneath everything he was doing. So they decided to start there. Verse 1 says Jesus was preaching and teaching right there in their own backyard in the temple. So they decided to confront him. Here was their question. By what authority are you doing these things? In other words, who gave you the right to walk in the temple and turn over the tables? Who gave you the right to preach about God's kingdom and announce forgiveness for people who simply turn their hearts towards God? Well, getting Jesus to make a misstep would prove to be far more difficult than they thought. See, Jesus totally gets the politics of the situation. The crowds believe he was sent by God. But if he says that directly, the leaders will charge him with blasphemy and probably haul him off to the Romans in hopes the Romans can be persuaded that he should be killed on the theory that if you let him keep speaking, he's going to stir up a riot and when Rome hears about a riot in Israel, you, the leaders of Rome, will be in trouble. You, the leaders of the Romans who are occupying this land, will be in trouble. But if he said, well, you know, I'm just kind of doing this on my own, well, that would undermine his credibility, his street credibility with the people. See, Jesus is always a step ahead of them. He said, okay, you answer my question first. John's baptism. Did it come from heaven? Meaning, is God behind it? Or was it merely human? See, it was an ingenious ploy. And uh, this is just part of this chess match that stretches out until the end of the week. Make the religious leaders take a position on John, who was enormously popular with the people. Yes, he was dead, killed by Herod. But in people's minds, there was no doubt. John was a prophet sent by God to baptize people as a sign of their repentance. The religious leaders couldn't refute that without risking a riot of their own. And they were not about to say he was sent by God because that would suggest that Jesus also came from God because Jesus had so closely aligned himself with John the Baptist. They gave a politician's answer. They said, we don't know. At which point Jesus said, then I am not going to answer your question. And then Jesus went on, as he so often did, to back it up with a story, a powerful story. Jesus relies so much on stories to make his points. I want you to notice his posture here. This is important, all right? We'll find out why in a minute. It says he turned to the people to tell this story. The reason that's important is because we find out the religious leaders assumed he was done talking to them. He turned away from them and turned to the people. But Jesus definitely wanted the religious leaders to hear this story. And I want us to listen carefully to what's in this story. Yes, it was a story about what was happening to Jesus in real time. That's true, but there was more to it than that. Folks, it's a story with us in it as well. It's a story that calls us to make a decision about how we're going to live our lives and what or who we're going to live for. There are three 
clear rejections in this story. They were fatal for Israel. And I want to ask if any of them are rejections we, any of us, all of us, you, me, have ever been guilty of. Okay? Here's the first one. The rejection of God's servants. Do you think God has ever sent anyone into your life to talk to you about something and you wouldn't hear of it? Think that's ever happened? In the parable, Jesus tells about a vineyard owner who planted, what did he plant? A vineyard, right? Planted a vineyard. And then he leased it out to some tenants to work it and to send him his fair share after the harvest. Now the problem was the tenants didn't want to give the owner his due. They wanted to keep all the profits for themselves so that when the owner would send out these servants to collect, the tenants would beat them up and reject them and send them back to the owner empty-handed. And this process went on for some time until the owner got weary and angry. Now, you know that lots of times Jesus doesn't explain his parables, does he? I mean, he just kind of leaves them there and lets them sink in and do their work on us. Well, this time he explained it, and that tells us he was clearly irritated. No beating around the bush, no leaving it to people to figure out. He said in verse 19 that the resistant, rebellious tenants were who? Who are they? the religious leaders of Israel. And the vineyard was Israel itself, but the people in charge of Israel's faith were corrupt. They had built a religious system that benefited them financially and otherwise, and they thought they had everything so figured out that quite a while ago they'd actually stopped listening to God. Has that ever happened to you? You got so set in your ways that you inadvertently quit listening to God. I think it happens to us more often than we realize. Maybe not on this scale, you know, where the spiritual life of a whole nation hangs in the balance. But it happens. We think we know the right answer to something happening in our lives, maybe something happening in the church, and we never really bother to ask God. We never bother to pray and say, God, what is the right answer here? Do you want to change my heart and my attitude about something? See, over the centuries, God had been sending prophets to try and turn Israel around. And one after another, those prophets were rejected. The prophet's message was not popular because they did what? They named the elephants in the room. That's what they did. They were the whistleblowers. They talked about things like idolatry and injustice and oppression and lack of compassion and uh, corrupt court systems. The problems all human societies struggle with because of this basic fallenness of human nature and we should not think that because we live in a democracy somehow our society is an exception. It's not true. These sins have a way of showing up in every generation of human beings. And the prophets warned of judgment to come if Israel did not turn back to God and listen to him and become the people God wanted them to be. And God tried everything to get them to listen. Some of these prophets, think about Hosea for a minute. God turned his whole life into a giant object lesson having him marry a former prostitute who then returned to her trade so that God could say to the people, now you know how I feel when you give your worship to false gods and when you refuse to practice justice in your land and when you refuse to care for the poor. See, prophets spoke in plain and direct language most of the time. It wasn't hard to figure out what they were talking about. 
And no one put it into a better sound bite form than Micah. Remember these words from Micah? Let's put those up on the screen. Let's join together in saying these words, okay? O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To do what is right. To love mercy. To walk humbly with your God. I know. You know, it's, uh, it's a lot when you let it go deep. It's easier said than done. But it's not impossible, is it? To seek out the heart of God so that we know what's right. To ask him. To love mercy. To extend mercy to people around us. To walk humbly with your God. In other words, let God tell us what to do. Not us tell God what he should do. There's a lot that goes into it. But I want to ask you this question. What if every day, you, me, we woke up in the morning and these words were in our morning prayer. We said, God, today help me put all my energy into doing what is right. To loving mercy and showing it to people around me. To walking humbly with you. Here's the next one. The rejection of God's son. Do you think that you have ever rejected Jesus, God's son, without realizing it or thinking about it very much. So notice what happens here. With a deep yearning not to give up, the owner of that vineyard decided this time he would send his son. Surely, he reasoned, surely they will listen to my son, my flesh and blood, a member of my own household. What happened? His son did not fare any better than the prophet's thinking he would be the last and they could get away with it and they could have the vineyard to themselves. They murdered him. They forced the owner to either leave them alone and let them do what they were doing or to bring down heavy judgment on them. And folks, the owner was not about to give up this vineyard altogether, so he brought down judgment. And hearing that, how did the crowd react? They got involved in the story. They said out loud, how terrible that would be. And it says Jesus looked at them and he quoted Psalm 118, making it clear he was the son in that story. God was the owner of the vineyard and Israel's religious leaders were the wicked tenants by rejecting Jesus, the religious leaders were bringing God's judgment down on themselves. All of Israel would have to share in the pain of the punishment. That's the way it happens when God brings down his heavy hand of judgment. Those who are close by experience it too. The rejection of their own Messiah and Savior would lead to the good news of the kingdom being extended to the whole Gentile world. Now you say, well, that's not a bad thing. That's right. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But here's the problem. Most of Israel would end up missing out on the salvation God gave them through their Messiah because of their rejection of him. We have to remember, it had been God's plan for Israel to be that great light to all the nations and through their obedience to God, they were supposed to bring these nations to their Messiah. The responsibility for taking the good news to the world passed from the nation Israel to, who did it pass to? Who? The church. The church. The church. Israel rejected the Messiah. God handed off the responsibility for taking the good news of the Messiah's coming and of the kingdom of God 
to the church. Jesus told his disciples after his resurrection in what we now call the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. We need to understand the significance of what happened that week in Jerusalem. Despite his rejection, Jesus was and remains Israel's and the world's Messiah. And folks, we either find salvation in him or we do not find it at all. Do you believe that? We either find salvation in Jesus or we do not find it at all. And Psalm 118 had predicted all of this. The stone the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. In another place, quoted in another gospel account, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Because the stone the builders rejected is the cornerstone. And that prompts the key question for all of us, what are you doing with Jesus? You got one of two choices. You can accept him, you can welcome him into your heart, you can make a commitment to follow him as your Lord, which means he's the leader of your life. That's what it means. You can even use stronger language. He's the ruler of your life. That's what he wants us to do, and that is how we enter his kingdom, and that's the only way we enter his kingdom, by turning our lives and control of them over to him. Or we can reject him. We can say, well, that's not for me. No, thank you. But beware. If you choose that path, you will face judgment for your sins. And as a result, you will spend eternity apart from God. Spending eternity apart from God is probably the purest and simplest definition of hell. Imagine living eternally with no access to God. The Bible makes it clear there is no other way. It's not enough to say, I believe in God. You know, the Apostle James addressed this. He said, hey, even the demons believe in God. That's not enough. God requires us to respond. A full welcome of Jesus and a commitment to follow him is the only thing that brings anyone into the kingdom of God. And folks, the time to respond is now. If you've never done that, the time to respond is now. When you hear the good news of Jesus proclaimed. That brings us to this last one, the rejection of God's authority. Have you ever rejected God's authority in your life? I think we probably have, all of us. Maybe more times than we realize. I'm sure I have. Let's go back to where this whole incident started. Jesus just answered their main question, didn't he? I mean, he answered it with a story. He just didn't, you know, say, yes, my authority comes from God. He said, listen to this story. They wanted to know where his authority came from. It was embedded in the story. The stone the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone Folks, that's an autobiographical statement. That's Jesus talking about himself. Whenever people hear about Jesus, they are confronted with an authority question. Because it is by God's authority that Jesus is our Messiah and our Savior. That came down from God. And isn't that what Peter meant when he was preaching the very first Christian sermon? This is after Jesus had been resurrected and then, you know, ascended back into heaven and the Holy Spirit fell upon his disciples waiting in Jerusalem. Peter got up, had to explain everything that was going on. He preached. Here's what he said. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus to be both Lord and Messiah. Boy, isn't it true? The authority issue is the very hardest for many people in coming to Jesus. 
They are not going to give up control over their lives. I cannot tell you how many conversations over the years that I've had with people, many of them in my office and sometimes in other places where we talk about what it would mean to commit your life to Jesus. And they say to me things like, I just can't do that. I can't turn control of my life over to anyone else, even Jesus. When anyone accepts and follows Jesus, that person is accepting God Almighty's authority in their life. And when anybody rejects Jesus, that person is rejecting God Almighty's authority in their life. When we say, oh, I believe Jesus is Lord and I'm going to follow him, but then don't really follow him. Don't organize our lives around what it means to follow him. Don't accept his priorities for our lives. Don't address stubborn issues of sin in our lives. Don't make self-sacrificial decisions about how we're going to live. Don't let his values rule our lives. Values like mercy and justice and compassion and humility. What's happening? What's happening? We're rejecting God's authority. That's what's happening. See, it's possible to say, oh, I follow Christ, but then not walk the walk and not live the life. And it's dangerous. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to Jesus, maybe for the first time, to enter his kingdom. And maybe you've been around it for a while and, you know, you've kind of been living around the edge and you've heard the good news. Today, I want to invite you to welcome Jesus into your heart. Take that step of faith across that threshold into his kingdom. But maybe you've taken that step, maybe you took it a long time ago, but you've kind of lost your way. You've lost your footing. Jesus is in your life. He's somewhere, but he's not the Lord. He's not the king. He's not the ruler. Things have happened Trouble in your family, financial issues, materialism has gotten the best of you, some really toxic attitudes have set up shop in your soul. And Jesus is not the Lord any longer. I want to invite you to turn back to him and to commit yourself again to following him as your Lord. Let's pray together. God, in this Lent season, as we try to go deep into your word and try to get a, a new look at Jesus, speak into our hearts and lives in new ways, all of us. Maybe there's somebody here this morning who has never taken the step of faith into God's kingdom, never welcomed Jesus into your heart, never made a commitment to follow him as your leader and as your Lord. That tugging in your heart, that urge you feel that's from God that's the Holy Spirit that's Jesus knocking at the door of your heart take that step with me this morning I invite you to pray this prayer dear God I've lived my life a certain way now I want to follow Jesus I confess my sins, my failures. I ask you to forgive me. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart now. And I will, I will follow you as my Lord, whatever that means. Teach me what that means.
Maybe you made the commitment to follow Jesus a long time ago, but that commitment is not alive and vital. It's not at the center of your heart. It's not what you wake up with each morning. It's not the last thought on your mind when you go to bed at night. Jesus has gotten lost amid all the rest of the stuff in your life. I want to invite you to make a recommitment of your life. To commit yourself to following Jesus as your Lord and the Lord of everything. Give him your struggles, give him your pain, give him the baggage, give him your attitudes. Let him sort it all out and do something new. Join me in this prayer, dear God. I know I need to start again on this. Jesus, be my Lord. I want you to be first. I want you to be number one in my heart. I wanna put my sins behind me. I ask you to forgive me. Reorder my priorities. Let me put you first in everything. God, Jesus was so bold to walk right into Jerusalem, walk right into the temple, teach the truth about your love, your grace, your reach to us, your forgiveness. In him and him alone is true and eternal life. All of us, every one of us, do your work in our hearts. Whatever it means, do your work in our hearts. We thank you and we praise you in the name of the one who would not stop until he had accomplished all of your will. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.